Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Tony Lanzapane. We're uh, going to get started in just a minute. We're, we'll let the people trickle in. So just uh, please be patient. We'll get started momentarily. Okay, so uh, let me uh, let me get started. So, uh, so today we're going to talk about insider risk management and uh, incident response. Uh, so, a uh, great session that we've got scheduled for for you today. We've got uh, Richard Becerra and Andrea Fisher, two uh, two of our great uh, Microsoft uh, technical specialists uh, covering state and local government. But before we get started, I've got a question for uh, for Rich Richard. Oh, hey, Richard. Yep. Do you know Do you know what the French groundhog sees on February second? I got no idea. It's Chateau. <laughs> so, I like that, man. Okay. So, uh, with that being said, um, uh, when we get started, I mean, we, we uh, you, I think you're going to go into some of the the details behind why, why uh, incident uh, uh, inside of risk is so such a high priority. I mean, you, you know, organizations might not think that it's a problem, but you know, good people have bad days, and they, they might accidentally, uh, you know, you know. Uh, Expose some information to uh, to some uh, some people outside the organization that shouldn't see it. So we've got some tools that can help our customers, uh, you know, kind of protect their their environment, and then you know we have incident response tools to help them kind of navigate through the uh, through the scenario. So with that being said, uh, Richard, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Hey, thanks a lot, Tony. So I'm Richard Becerra. I work with our compliance technical specialist team for state and local government. And as Tony mentioned today, we're just going to talk about the insider risk management tool and how that relates to some of the state and local government challenges with meeting data protection requirements. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this PowerPoint. I do want to get to a demo, but there are a few points that I do want to cover. So for the most part, and if you've participated in some of these webinars, you may have seen or heard some of these numbers before. Most of the data loss that a state agency or a private organization encounters is accidental. It's people who are, as Tony mentioned, good people having a bad day. They hit the wrong reply email or the reply all without checking the senders correctly in the email. They put their data on a USB drive and went home and worked on it without realizing it needs to stay in the office. The majority of it is accidental. It's non-malicious. But that still leaves around 12 to 20 percent of insider risks that are. It's people that are trying to get that stuff out and they're trying to evade our security. So how do you detect that and why is that such a problem? Well, we know based on the, the data breach investigations report from 2022 and Microsoft's own internal threat investigations report. Insider risk data breaches account for about seven and a half million dollars per incident. So every time somebody sneaks data out with the intent of maliciously using it, selling it to a competitor or putting it on the dark web, whether it's PII or it's PHI or it's payment card data, those come out to about seven and a half million dollars in fines in credit protection services that have to be purchased afterwards and investigation costs each time. And by the time you detect somebody who has been doing this sort of thing for months, that could be multiple incidents that you have to go back and remediate and spend that money on. So that cost rises very quickly. Organizations know this and they're trying to get their hands around it all and doing that usually means they're picking up a bunch of fragmented solutions. There's something to audit activity, and then there's something else to monitor their email, and then there's another one to monitor chat, or there's another solution to monitor um, their home activity on their endpoint devices. Multiple admin portals, 
multiple series of credentials that have to be managed, multiple teams that all have to be watched from different panes of audit logs. It makes it hard to keep a full view of everything that's going on, and there's a real possibility data gets missed. And why is this so difficult? Well, as most of us know, that data is all over the place now. We're no longer working in a world where it lives in a server and it lives on a computer and that's the end of it. Now it's in cloud storage. Now it's in one place where 10 different people collaborate on the same document at different times throughout the day. Now it's in transit through chat messages, through Teams, through email. Now it lives on mobile devices and it has to be equally monitored and protected everywhere. So the challenge goes way up when you're trying to watch somebody's activity in all these locations. So insider risk management is how we start looking at that. And it's how we start applying context to somebody's activity rather than just looking at that moment in time where they moved something off the computer or they sent an email. Now we can actually see all of their behavior prior to that and afterwards, and we get a better grip on the larger picture around it. Now, obviously, if we're doing a deeper dive like this on somebody's activity, we want to maintain privacy. We do need to keep it somewhat simplified because we're looking at so much data all at once. So there's kind of a big brother concern. Are we over, you know, overextending our hand? Are we digging a little too deep into our employees' activity? And so we built privacy in with insider risk from start to finish. Starting with pseudonymization, this is uh, something that's turned on by default. When insider risk management detects a threat or detects any kind of issue or problem, you don't have to necessarily see the username that's attached to it. You may not want your analysts to know they're investigating their manager or their by a friend that they've worked with for 10 years. You need them to be as objective as possible when they're making an assessment about whether or not this constitutes a threat. We can turn this on by default so that they just see this random string of numbers and letters. When you're implementing this tool, you can also use your RBAC controls, that's role-based access controls, to make sure only your SOC analysts or only your data analysts that you've vetted, who've passed your background checks, can actually use this tool and start looking at all this activity. So if you have your small group of people and you need to make sure they can't look at other stuff in the uh, compliance center, they can't go perform scans on their friends, they can't look up their own data, you have a way to do that. And you can control what they can look at and what activity they can take. And of course, there is a concern that, again, as I said, you might be over investigating your employees you have to, uh, or other your admins, have to explicitly turn this on and scope people into the tool. So as soon as you run IRM, it's not gonna go through and immediately start uh, snooping in on all of your employees. IRM is only going to look at the people who violate a threshold that your admins can set and you can define beforehand, and everybody else it's just gonna ignore. It's going to wait until they either trip one of your wires or your admins explicitly grab one of those people and say, we need to look at this person's activity right now. It won't automatically go through and start spying on everybody. And of course, we maintain audit logs for all of our admins, sort of watch the watcher approach. So your admins activity, when they turn on a policy, if they clear out an alert or a record, all of that is retained. And it's in a separate audit log that is distinct from the audit logs contained elsewhere in the Microsoft Purview Center. So you can come in and you can see if one of your admins has been dismissing a bunch of logs for the same user, or if they've uh, changed policies that maybe didn't match what you defined for them to do. All of that is preserved and is kept. You can go in and look at it anytime you need. So what does IRM actually do? This is how this is how IRM starts actually examining this and giving you that context to make a decision, to give you that full picture. So it starts with a trigger. An employee submits a resignation, for example, 
in your company's HR tool. Bam, that is going to turn on one of your IRM policies. And the IRM policy is going to start looking at how many files they've downloaded in the past 30 days. Uh, how many files have they deleted? Did they send emails containing credit card numbers or containing social security numbers? Um, did they pull down a bunch of stuff, rename it and delete it off their machine after they moved it to a USB? All of that activity starts getting looked at when they put in their resignation date in your little HR tool. Or let's say you don't have an HR tool set up. You can designate high impact users. So if you've got people that are working with uh, blueprints, engineers that have to access schematics for power substations, for example, and they know the locations of them, or if you have people who have to access uh, protected health information and they're considered high impact, if they start doing things with that data, you can have them go, okay, they're a little more sensitive. We need to scrutinize their activity more than our average floor employees. Or if you have somebody that uh, gets caught in one of your communication compliance policies. So let's say Joe sends Sally a harassing email and it triggers one of your, one of your communication compliance policies. You can have IRM start looking at Joe's activity. This may not be the first time he sent something like that. It may just be the first time he got caught. And now you can start looking at his other activity. Has he been trying to send email like this to other people? Has he been downloading data or has he been doing other things that now we need to know about? And all of that can be automated. That moves into sequence detection. Because as I mentioned earlier, looking at these in just kind of a one point in time doesn't give you the full picture. If somebody uh, pulls down a label on a document, there could be any number of innocuous explanations for that. Maybe they needed to communicate it to somebody outside the environment that you're doing business with. If somebody saved a file to a USB drive, they could just as easily say, hey, I didn't know, or I needed to work on it at home. Again, very easily explained. Same thing if they needed to delete files. They could say, hey, I didn't do that, or I thought there was an extra copy of it, I'm sorry. So each one of those in a vacuum doesn't really give you that intent. But IRM can look at these as a sequence. They happen within two minutes or a day apart from each other, whatever you define. And now you can look at the larger picture of it. And you can say, okay, this person downloaded, uh, downgraded the sensitivity label from putting encryption on this document to no encryption. A minute later, moved it onto a USB drive off of a protected SharePoint site. A minute after that, they deleted it from their machine and from their SharePoint site. All of that happened within three minutes. Okay, so this probably wasn't just innocent business as usual. That's the kind of context that you get with sequence detection. And then there is, of course, our anomaly detection, benchmarking. IRM is smart enough to know when somebody's average activity for a day or a week exceeds what they normally do. So if you have an employee that sends 50 emails a week, and then one week they start sending a thousand emails to some external address, IRM can detect that automatically, send you an alert and start looking at the rest of their activity. It can tell that that is unusual and you don't have to wait for some SOC analyst or an admin to go in and actually see that and start raising the alert themselves. IRM can look at it and start collaborating all of that together, or collating all that activity. And IRM puts it together in something that's easy to see. And we're gonna look at this in the demo in just a minute, but you can look at a scatter plot like this of their activity. Here's the risk score on the y-axis on the left-hand side. And then of course the dates on the x-axis down at the bottom. And you can see the sequences of activities that are tied to one another, or you can see when they happened independent, but close enough in time that they might be related. It's a good way of looking at everything that they've done up to that point in a very quick, easy to understand visual medium, instead of just a wall of text that an admin has to scrutinize. Now on the right, there is this mention of the forensic evidence feature. That's in preview, so I'm not gonna go too deep into detail about it, 
but forensic evidence is a way of performing screen captures and screen recordings of somebody's activity. If they trip one of your policies and you need to know uh, if they're working on something or if you need to record their activity for compliance purposes, you can set up your screen captures here to capture the last 30 seconds up to a minute or the following minute and 30 seconds after the activity was detected on their endpoint device. Now, as I mentioned, this is preview and it's not available to our government customers yet. But if you are interested, we can go into a deeper dive about this. And this right here is just an example of what your initial analytics could look like with the Insider Risk Management tool. You don't need to deploy anything to anybody's machines to get this information. You don't need to go set up any kind of custom permissions. You can just run the IRM analytics. It's a very simple button in the Compliance Center. And it will return within 48 hours this examination of your environment and it gives you a percentage as you can see on the right hand side of potential data theft or other activities uh, how many people are working with your sensitive data how does that compare to the people who are just doing their normal jobs this is how you can start sculpting your policies and deciding where your analysts need to spend their limited time and with that, I do want to cover this here, but I do want to close up and move on to our demo. So give me one second and I am going to share my screen. I want to show you what this actually looks like in the Insider Risk Management tool. Ah, here we go. It's one thing to hear all this on a PowerPoint, but it's another to see it actually being used and what it looks like when you work with it. This is what your insider risk management pane could look like after you run your analytics. It gives you any alerts to review if any have matched your policies yet, and if any of them have been escalated to active cases. So what kind of information does an alert actually contain? Now, these alerts are specific to users, to your employees. And at this level, those same employee names are anonymized wherever they appear. You can't see that you're investigating somebody you may know unless you have an admin turn that on for you or toggle it during the case uh, section. So right now we're just looking at somebody's alerts. Right here we have our triggering event, an HR connector imported a resignation date. They typed in, OK, we're going to resign on this day, and that told IRM, all right, let's start looking at their activity and find out if we need to be concerned or not. And IRM has determined that from data infiltration, there's a, there's a reason for our investigators to pay attention. So let's see what that might look like here. On our scatter plot point, for example, we have this sequence of events right here that tells us, hey, this person collected some data and cleaned it up, leading up to their resignation date. And we can see right here a little more detail about that. So they resigned right here. They input their resignation date on November 27th. They're actually going to leave December 17th. OK, so let's see what this uh, obfuscation sequence is here. On November 21st, a couple of days beforehand, they downloaded some files from SharePoint, 45 of them exactly. And some of them, two of them contain some credit card numbers and others contained our sensitivity label confidential. Now, whatever confidential means is specific to our organization. That could imply PII, that could imply other controlled data. But we do know that it is data that matters to us. It had that label on it, and there were 34 of these on that one day. The following day, November 22nd, they came in here and they started renaming those files, including some of the ones that contained sensitive extensions, which is another thing that we can define. What is a priority file extension? In this example, it's PDFs and PowerPoints, but this could also be CAD files as well. This could be specific doc files. It can be defined by you. And the following day, 
they went ahead and printed files out, two of them that contained those credit card numbers. And the following day after that, they deleted these files from their machine, files that contained that priority extension. And you can see right here at the top, we have this handy little summary right here. From start to finish, November 21st to the 24th, these are the activities. None of these activities take a day to complete. You should be able to do this if this were part of your normal regular job within the course of a single day. And if we need to get more context, we actually have a handy link right to the forensic evidence if that's enabled for our environment. And this led right up to their resignation date three days later. So we know that they downloaded some data, they renamed it, they cleared it off their machine, and they printed it a couple of days before they resigned. We know that it was sensitive data that contained credit card numbers and contained some of our sensitivity labels. And this is information that an analyst can use to determine a further course of action. So let's say our analyst here has escalated this to a case. So we're no longer dealing with it as strictly an alert. Now we need to actually take some action against it. Here's what our case will look like. It contains all the information we just gathered from our alert. Dates, times, the activities that we looked at, everything. We can come here and see their user activity on this scatter plot. But we can also see the activity explorer right here as it correlates to this activity. And if we need to get even more detail, we can. So here's the ID for it, here's the date, here is the uh, IP address for it, what happened. Again, all the details that an investigator would have to go through here and start manually aggregating, IRM has pulled in for them. And it's all here whenever they need to look at it. They can filter it by date. They can filter it by the activity account. And they can start actually adding case notes. And as you can see, we have something here that says, hey, the circumstances surrounding this case, this employee is about to resign. This employee themselves had access to sensitive data. HR says we should send this up to legal. Which is something that can easily be done from right here. When this is escalated for investigation, this can turn into an e-discovery case that you can have a separate team have access to in case they need to find any of this content and put holds on this data or on any of these emails if they need to export it and start sending it up to another department in preparation for legal action. All of that can be done right here. Send it up to an e-discovery case and now your e-discovery team and take the ball from there. Prior to the use of insider risk management, aggregating all of this information and making sense of it, making an assessment from it, could take days, if not weeks. You'd be going through audit logs, you'd be going through activity logs, you'd be talking to the employee, looking at email history, and you might still be looking up a dead end. Doing it all manually means your employee or your analysts might still be running into a wall and not realize it until they get to the end of all that activity. It's wasted time, it's uh, red herring susceptible. You could be off looking at something that's not relevant to what the actual threat is. Meanwhile, your internal threat is continuing to act. IRM is what allows you to automate all of that, examine it for you, aggregate that information for you, and save your analysts time. It's the difference between weeks of investigation and hours. And it's the difference between looking up things that may not be relevant and things that are important, but which are trying to go undetected. Now, insider risk management has a way to connect to Microsoft Sentinel and some of this information can be sent to that as well. So once you've detected this stuff, what do you actually do with it all? This is the scene. This is the point where your SOC team can get involved. And this is where I'm actually going to turn it over to Andrea Fisher, who is our security specialist, and let her talk about the incident response. Once you have this information, what do you do with it?
governance issue can inform a bigger security issue. Or I'll also show you, um, we have sort of a two-way connectivity between uh, the compliance tools and Sentinel, where the compliance people can report something up to the SOC, the Sentinel, the SIM team, or maybe the SIM team might know something that um, the compliance people don't know, and they will notify in the other direction. Um, but this is pretty much what Richard talked about, but some of the reasons you might want to forward those compliance issues on into Sentinel will be because we have even more signals coming in from more places, right? Um, you probably wouldn't be using firewalls for um, too much when it comes to uh, worrying about compliance, but certainly user entity behavioral analysis, which is a big strength of our SIM tool. Um, a lot of that, you know, traditionally, as Richard said earlier as well, you know, the compliance and insider risk uh, monitoring was very configuration heavy. It required scripting or custom tools and all of those things, but with uh, the introduction of the purview tools as well as its ability to come into Sentinel, we can make things a whole lot easier for you. Um, we have a built-in native connector that sends that data from purview up into Sentinel. Lots of applicable rules and uh, alerting that comes with that and the ability to use our built-in user entity behavioral analysis and artificial intelligence tools to aggregate that data in different ways. Uh, sometimes uh, our human eyeballs uh, may not see things in a certain way, right? We'll see a couple of yellow alerts and think, oh, that's not a big deal. But the artificial intelligence involved in the Sentinel tool uh, looks across graphical based uh, timeframes for uh, things that might correlate together. So where we might see a bunch of yellow alerts, it realizes that it's a bigger deal uh, than it might have seemed to us. But let's talk again. Um, there's also going to be a uh, integrated workbook, and I'll show you this. Uh, in Sentinel, workbooks are really just fancy dashboards, but the benefit of bringing that data from the compliance tool into Sentinel is that we can show you some additional data analysis that is not in the compliance tool itself. Like we can look at the sign in logs. We can look at watch lists. Maybe you're going to create a watch list of either recently terminated employees or uh, VIP users or VIP desktops, and we can help do additional alerting on those things. Also, the ability to do much more uh, granular hunting. So, if we do need to start looking at people's behaviors, we can uh, do some very rich querying. Uh, but let's go ahead and we'll drop out of here. And this is Microsoft Sentinel. Like I said, this is our SIM tool. And I would imagine that mostly what we have on this call are the people who deal with compliance day to day. So you may not ever look at this tool. In the box that says data connector you're going to have to take my word for it here and just click a button that says connect so this is what we call a direct connection so nothing additional to do we can have data flowing into sentinel in about mm, three to five minutes uh, as long as the internet uh, would agree with us here but i'm going to give up on that once we have that connector coming in 
we have data coming from the connector over to Sentinel. And what might we do uh, with that data is here is one of the alerts and we can see we see some insider risk uh, from an application. And what we might do is take advantage of that built in user entity behavioral analysis stuff that we were talking about. And we can click on any of the users involved in the incidents and find out more information about them. So Purview is telling us about it as the SOC, but in the SOC we can expand ourselves out and um, take a look at has this user had any password changes recently? Has this user um, had any other alerts? Has it cleared event logs? Is there other activity? Um, yeah, guys, I'm so sorry. This is just not working the way it should. Uh, but we should see here, you would see a beautiful chart <laughs> that would tell you uh, anything interesting that we do about this particular user. So not only do we have um, the ability to have that communication coming in from purview to us, Sentinel also has some rules of its own where it is looking for certain behaviors. So we may even know something that you don't. Um, so we might notify you. And you can see some of these things here are just general information. We can see uh, that someone created a default alert policy. We can see that someone started an e-discovery search, right? But this is the one I'm talking about here. So this is one that Sentinel discovered. Right, so you may not have even seen this in your tool, but we discovered it first. So what are we going to do with this? Right, we can see a machine learning um, has passed a certain threshold. So we could from here and the entities involved in this, two different users, two different machines. So what we might do here is we have what we call automation playbooks. And I have this set up anytime Sentinel catches an insider risk alert to send an email. And this is going to send an email to our compliance team. And so the compliance team would then get that immediate notification, right? I don't even have to be involved because this, if maybe this happens at two o'clock in a Saturday morning, the tool itself will go ahead and send that email anytime Sentinel generates an insider risk alert. And that email is going to have um, the ability to, it'll have, what's the alert name? Who were the users involved in the alert? What time did it happen? Tell me the description of what happened. And that will allow the compliance people to determine, do we need to take more action? I know this is the most thrilling demo you guys have ever seen. I apologize. Um, but. So uh, let's try one more. I really wanted to show you all the dashboard and I don't know if we're going to be able to. So we talked about having a workbook. And this is the Insider Risk Manage It workbook. And so you can see here is a list of additional activity that we will look at based on those alerts that have come to us from the compliance tool. So I can be looking at more information about the entities, what security alerts might have also been on those particular users or workstations, what security incidents. I can take a look at all of their sign-ins into Azure Active Directory. I can get some information about all of their Microsoft 365 activity, right? Whether that's Teams or Office, anything that's happening with the audit logs, right? Anything in DLP, all of that is available to me. Let's see if we can find something here that gives us a pretty chart. So we can see here uh, that we have lots of activity in the sign-in logs, in office activity, in the non-interactive sign-in logs. We can see over time what looks normal and what's out of the ordinary. Are there any particular security alerts, right? And we can see um, what they are. We can see I've got my insider risk alerts. I've got an outdated browser, which for me is a compliance issue here. I don't want anyone using those outdated browsers. I can see that e-discovery search kicking off. I can see if there were any MITRE attack tactics, which is something that the security people definitely want to be notified about, um, right? Is, am I interested in uh, initial access, right? Could someone, and again, 
that's a lot of times where our insider risk is that initial access coming from someone often, not nefariously, right? As Richard said earlier, sometimes, you know, we just do things because we don't know any better. Um, certainly, uh, that's the case for most of us all of the time. Uh, and again, uh, just more information to show you how this particular user might be also uh, causing issues in other places. So the um, workbook here is customizable. It can be just what you want it to be. We can create multiple workbooks for multiple people. Um, and I really, let's see if anything will actually work for me or not. So let's go to data connectors and see if this catches up. We'll take it back if we can. Well, I'm sorry, y'all, that should have uh, taken a good 25 minutes to walk you through all of this, but we just don't have the connectivity that we need today. But happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. No worries, Andrea, we understand there's sometimes technical issues outside of our control. <laughs> So uh, while we're, we're waiting for some questions to come, to come through, um, so uh, Andrea, Richard, I mean, uh, great job, uh, you know, uh, uh, network issues aside, um, how, how can customers get started with, uh, with, with these tools? Well, uh, I'll go first. If you have uh, insider risk management or if you have an interest in that and you have an E5 license, the first thing to do is just uh, set up your permissions for the people that you want to have access to it. Once you access the Insider Risk Management tool, it's as simple as just clicking the Run Analytics button, big bright blue button right there on the Insider Risk Management homepage. That will run, it'll take 48 hours, and that will tell you what you can do from there. Set up policies if you want, focus on your threats if you want, and it's a completely transparent policy, uh, process, excuse me, completely transparent process to your employees. It won't impact them. It won't impact their ability to do their jobs day to day. It won't slow down anybody's email. It is strictly a fact finding process that tells you where you can go next. So I think the most important part of the thing that Richard just said is right. You either need to own E5 or G5 that we call right or the mm -hmm. compliance suite. Uh, for Sentinel, uh, Sentinel is a completely different way to purchase things. It's more towards the Azure side if you're used to the way Azure is priced. Uh, it is based on ingestion and retention. So how long are you going to keep the data and how much are you going to bring into it? Uh, and then once we do, uh, we just turn on that data connector. And like we said, in about we could have the whole thing set up for you in about five minutes. Uh, but I did finally get an email to show up here. So this is if Sentinel discovered an incident, uh, it might send an email that looked like this to the compliance team with a description of what happened and all of the users uh, and what was going on with those users at the time. Any other questions we might want to answer? Okay, so, so feel free to uh, use the Q&A window in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in Teams to, uh, to ask questions. More than happy to carry on the conversation. Well, while we're doing that, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, do a plug for the, ne for the next couple of uh, sessions. So we, we've got a very full, uh, full, full uh, meeting uh, uh, webinar series this month. So next week, we're going to talk about enhancing data protection use, uh, reporting capabilities with Microsoft Information Protection. Then the following week on the February 16th, we're going to talk about uh, five things SLG customers can, should do for managing records. So uh, if you haven't signed up for those, uh, please feel free to uh, go out to the uh, website and, or, and sign up for them or uh, contact your, uh, your account team for more information. And if you're interested in using any of these tools, you don't have to figure it out on your own. That's something I want to reinforce. We're not just going to throw you out there and tell you figure it out, sink or swim. 
talk to your CSAMs, talk to your Microsoft account representatives. If you want to use IRM, let us know. We are more than happy to make the time. We'll sit down with you. We'll show you what to do. Same with Sentinel. We'll sit down. We'll show you what to start with. We'll start with the simple stuff first. We'll walk you through features you're interested in. You don't have to try and teach yourself how to make this work in your environment. Okay, well, we don't have any uh, questions coming in through the uh, chat window, so I don't know if uh, you, uh, Richard or Andrew, if you, if you have any uh, last minute thoughts, but um, why don't we start there and uh, close, the, close the call. Okay, well, well thank you. Everyone. Oh, go ahead, Andrea. No, I was just going to say, you know, one of the most interesting things to me about um, seeing others uh, do a proof of concept in with the compliance suite is very rarely is it true nefarious behavior, right? But we do find almost always people doing things that are probably not, not, not best practice. So if that is something that people would like to try out, I highly recommend it. I think it will be a, a huge education for uh, your users, for sure. And actually, uh, we, yeah, thanks for that, Andrea. We did, we did get one more one question from Jeff Martin. Can the notifications or tasks be filtered within Microsoft Teams to have, organ to have organized things better? Trying to avoid email fatigue. Absolutely. On my on the Sentinel end, um, we can control who gets what based on, you know, different regular expressions. It could be as something as simple as, you know, Tony gets uh, red alerts, I get yellow alerts, but it could also be very granular where only certain usernames, only certain types of data uh, get filtered down. We could use a management structure with playbooks, lots of flexibility, limited only by your imagination. <laughs> and within IRM, once you start doing an investigation, if you've decided that needs attention, you can actually set up a whole dedicated Microsoft team for that collaboration. So if you have multiple investigators and analysts and you don't want them all getting email fatigue, there's a workflow there to just build a team straight from the case dedicated for that purpose. And that can be used for all their collaboration. You can immediately sidestep the email fatigue that way. Thank you. That's, uh, that's our last question in the window. So uh, why don't we wrap things up? So thank you uh, everyone for joining today. Uh, thank you presenters for, uh, for sharing your wealth of information and we'll, uh, we'll uh, get together next week. Take care. Thank you everybody for attending our session today.